What a beautiful coin. Welcome back, one and all, to another fascinating video here on the culture of currency. Today we dive into a unique and very beautiful coin from the nation of Rwanda. I can tell you that this will be an eye-opening experience for many of you as I dive into some key points about Rwanda so that we can judge the cultural significance and relevance of this silver okapi in the bullion marketplace. So lock your tray tables in the upright position as we take a trip to Rwanda. Here we are, Rwanda, the most densely populated country in Africa. This interior country is roughly the size of Maryland for those of you who study maps and is extremely dense in population as you can see from this CIA diagram. It is thought that areas we know as Rwanda were developed into civilizations by humans during the Stone to Iron Ages, mostly by hunter and gathering tribes that were later known as the Bantu people. As many Africans, bands became tribes which often became kingdoms. Pay close attention to this next part because there's some crazy information that is coming that ties into this. The kingdom of Rwanda was dominant in the mid-18th century. The Tutsi kings were strong conquerors and centralized power. One of the things they did that can still be felt today are their anti-Hutu policies. One of the themes you will see strongly in this video are divided actions by the Tutsi and the Hutu peoples of Rwanda. Where we go next is not a pretty part of history, but I find it relevant to what is needed to understand the Rwandan people. For those of you who understand the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, or maybe the Catholic and Protestant fighting in Ireland, buckle up, because this story also shows a dark part of the human condition. There was a time where Germany and later Poland had their hands in the affairs of Rwanda and other parts of Africa during World War I, but that's a topic for another video with the exception of their continuation of pro-Tutsi policies. As often happens in oppressive situations, a revolt eventually happened, like we see in Cuba right now. This one was from 1959 to 1961, known by many as the Hutu Revolution. This was a strong ethnic violent time between the Hutus and the Tutsis, which are two of the three main ethnic groups of Rwanda. The transition led to the independence from a Belgian and pro-Tutsi rule, shifting that power to a Hutu-led republic. This is where those of you who like conspiracy theories can go crazy as things get even more sticky from here. The battle for power went back and forth for years. A couple of notes. During a rebellion in the 60s, over 300,000 Tutsis fled as refugees to other areas. For a couple of decades, the tide ebbed and flowed in a tit-for-tat of incidences between the Hutus and the Tutsis. Fast forward to the 90s and 1994 to be exact. In the US, we had President Clinton, we had Forrest Gump, and we hosted the World Cup. While in Rwanda, the Catholic Church becomes a player in policy and a president's plane gets shot down causing terror between the three months of April and July. An estimated number between 350,000 and a million Rwandans were murdered and what is documented is the most rapid genocide ever recorded. Seeing as this happened in Rwanda, it was not with gunfire and bombs, but rather with clubs, machetes, and instances like people being herded into buildings which were then lit on fire. The brutality level here is Holocaust-esque, but the harder pill to swallow is that the CIA and US Embassy in Kampala had known for years about the weapons and training sessions happening across the border in Uganda, Many of these things were funded by Uganda, and we did nothing. To add insult to injury, once the violence started to grow, the U.S. started funding Uganda, which escalated when USA named the president of Uganda as peacekeeper. For three years, Uganda purchased 10 times the weapons it had in prior years, spending 48% of their state budget on defense. As the murders were going on, the president of Uganda traveled to the U.S. to receive a public service medal and honorary doctorate from the University of Minnesota while being called a herdsman and philosopher and Nelson Mandela-like by Time magazine. It is also noted that he visited with President Clinton in Washington during all of this while the U.S. failed to respond or intervene. 
journalism eventually brought the stories to the public around the world. Images flashed on screens in all corners of the earth as people stood silent in disbelief. Three months and over 300,000 lives. Years of possible intervention with no direct action. But eventually, in the dark of night, the sun rose from the east to provide the light of one more day. Eventually, from the blood-stained ashes, this little country of Rwanda stood. They defied where other countries had fallen and resisted breaking into factions. In the dust of the past, the economy lagged, but humanity no longer turned a blind eye. A country that used agriculture, natural resources, and forestry as a means of GDP started to get other countries to tie in world dollars. The best representation of this is in the changing of the guard in terms of GDP earning sectors. Of all things, after the tragic recent events, tourism is the new king of currency in Rwanda. This has attracted foreign investments including Marriott, Radisson, and other fancy hotels, and an international conference hub, transfer network of transportations, and much more amicable travel and visa policies. The growth of tourism is verified as the world-class football slash soccer clubs of Arsenal and PSG out of France signed a three-year deal with Rwanda. This one signing is expected to increase the tourism dollars by 8%. Another great reason that people want to visit is that this is Africa. This is an area that has a vast collection of wildlife tours and an active volcano that is seismically stable at the moment. In a respectful fashion, they also have not hidden from their past. There are many memorials from the genocide as well as an ethnographic museum which might be one of the best examples of artifacts from many areas of Africa from pre-colonial times. I know I've given you some doom and gloom, but I stand here honestly stating that I would visit Rwanda if I had a chance, and I can honestly say that of all the places in Africa I want to visit, Rwanda is now my favorite number one. I will even look to purchase the traditional Rwandan basket for my house because I find them beautiful and there is one on this silver coin that we will review today. Speaking of silver coins, that is what you're here for, and now you understand Rwanda a little bit more, so let's dive in. On the front of this coin, we have a beautiful and unique display of pride in the seal of Rwanda. We see the branches of sorghum, a traditional basket, and coffee above a cog which usually symbolizes industry. Above, of course, we have the text meaning Republic of Rwanda as well as the sun and these items are defended by traditional Rwandan shields which kind of look like brackets on a keyboard. The border is a rope tied in a square knot that is just above the words unity, work, and patriotism. This coat of arms was redesigned in 2001 to promote unity. I must say that one of my favorite things about African coins are the front. These coats of arms are beyond unique and so enjoyable, and not to mention refreshing since they are not the queen. Anyway, this is well done and interesting for a front and I scored a 7. Now for the back. Many of the coins from Rwanda have the same feel to them and this series of animal features Africa as a main focus. Ours of course features a mother and baby okapi, which is a rare and interesting animal who to my knowledge has only direct relation to the giraffe. The stripes make you think of a zebra and you can kind of see the face resembling a giraffe. I love the dark brown and white combo on this animal. They are so reclusive that modern science did not know it existed until the early 1900s. I find it to be well done artwork and appreciate the English words but would rather it be in the common language so that I could see their symbols. Overall, a well done above average quality back so it scores an 8 out of 10. Mintage is our next area and is a bit of a sticky wicket. According to the Mint, they only stop minting this coin when the next year is released, so we will not have a firm number until after 2022. But that means I have to score to 5. My assumption that it will probably be a bit higher in time once that is released, uh, my guess is a 6 or 7, but now I have to do it at a 5. Now for cultural significance. I could say a lot here, but as you know, it's hard to beat a coat of arms, a cultural icon like the Okapi, and the continent of Africa. This is an obvious 10 from me. Now we travel to a strong area which is collectability. My research indicates coins from Rwanda are strong contenders of collectability. They offer many to many collectors with the wildlife theme. They put out a couple of series that are all in decent demand and they seem to stay in a fairly low mintage. Not to mention they are usually around 40mm which just feels better in the hand. 
I scored this an 8. I don't find it to be strong enough of a series and low enough mintage to score a 10, but it's a contender for sure. Uniqueness is our last area. This is the only coin I've ever seen with an Okapi. This series tends to have very unique animals. Last year was a shoe bill, and I bet many of you have no idea what a shoe bill is. The coat of arms is obviously unique, which scores it a 10. Our total has been tabulated, and if my math is correct, we're sitting at a 48 with an unknown mintage. This means it is my best bet that this is going to be an elite level coin once we get a firm number. 48 is, however, a very high score and means that I highly recommend this coin on this channel. So there it is, the Okapi. Take it or leave it, your call. But my call is to grab one. So thank you for watching, and as always, Please stay classy and current with the culture of currency.